Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. Um, let me preface my talk about Kurt Vonnegut by reading you the, just the first page of the prologue, and that will serve as kind of a springboard for what I have to say to you about his, his life and his works and the relationship that I had with him, our friendship. This is from the prologue, Out of Print and Scared to Death, and it starts like this. Kurt Vonnegut planned to give this new teaching job at the University of Iowa his best shot. As he zoomed across the Midwest in early September 1965 in his son's new Volkswagen Beetle, his six-foot frame pressing, against his head, pressing his head against the roof liner, it was as if failure were clattering behind him like tin cans tied to the bumper. The ashtray was stuffed with crushed butts of Pall Mall cigarettes, and the windshield was tawny with nicotine from his chain smoking. He had a lot to think about, and the 1,200-mile cross-country drive between his home on Cape Cod and Iowa City, Iowa, gave him all the time he needed. He was bored by his 20-year marriage to his first love, the former Jane Cox, whom he'd married barely five months after his release from a prisoner of war camp at the end of World War II. This past summer, he'd been trying to start an affair with a woman in New York 20 years his junior, who in turn was waiting for the writer William Price Fox to divorce his wife so they could marry. If this writer in residence job in the respected Iowa Writers Workshop didn't suit him, he was going to leave it and compensate himself for his trouble by coming on strong with Sarah. On the other hand, he would remind her that he was just an old booze hound on the hunt for affection, and she was just a girl, and he was old enough to be her father. She needed him like a case of shingles. Now, why start a book in, in media rest like that, in the middle of the man's life? It's because Kurt Vonnegut wasn't famous, wasn't popular, until he was almost 50 years old. For the first part of his writing life, the majority of it, in fact, Kurt Vonnegut was a freelance writer who was writing fiction for popular magazines like Collier's and Ladies Home Journal and Saturday Evening Post, and just barely making it. He had a large family of six children, uh, they lived in a big ramshackle house on Cape Cod, and Kurt was living paycheck to paycheck. To try and put food on the table, he not only wrote stories, but he tried uh, teaching uh, special education for a semester, and that didn't go all that well. Then he uh, received an inheritance from his father and decided that he should go into selling Saab automobiles on the Cape because uh, he thought it was an ideal job for a writer. You just put the new cars in the showroom, people come in and buy them, and you can sit in the back and write all day lost his shirt. So Kurt was not doing well in 1965 when he went out to Iowa for the Iowa Writers Workshop. Now jump ahead just a few years to when he sort of swims into my view and into the view of a generation. It's 1969 and I'm a, a college uh, student at the University of Illinois, draft eligible, 1A, facing the war in Vietnam, and uh, like so many of the young men my age, our fathers had fought in World War II so we were facing truly a moral dilemma. Um, would we serve? Where did our duty lay? Uh, would, we, would we fight? Uh, what, if we didn't feel that, what if we felt that we couldn't? What would we do instead? And then suddenly, breaking like a storm over us is Slaughterhouse-Five in 1969. And we embraced it because here we were feeling bewildered and disoriented, not knowing what we would do. And in Slaughterhouse-Five is Billy Pilgrim, a private trying to be a good soldier who doesn't know what's happening and worse than that is suffering from this strange phenomenon where he ricochets around in time. Looking back now we know that it was probably a manifestation of post-traumatic stress disorder which was undiagnosed at that time but Billy Pilgrim finds himself talking to Rotary and then somebody will say something and suddenly he's back in the Battle of the Bulge lying in the snow. And then he's back in front of Rotary. And then he's in his office. And then he's somewhere on a far-flung planet called Tralfamador, uh, at the far end of the universe, where he's safe. And there's someone who loves him. And time has no meaning. And then he's back again. And this book, with its, with its uh, non-chronology, with its flashbacks, with its droll humor and, and moments of terror, really seemed to capture what a lot of us were feeling. So when I finished Mockingbird, A Portrait of Harper Lee, and I was looking around for another subject for a biography, first of all, I wanted to know who hasn't had a biography written about him or her, um, and who had a big impact on people my age. 
Well, Kurt Vonnegut came to mind right away, and I was surprised that he had, in fact, never had a biography written about him. And it turned out that he was a little bit miffed that nobody had ever taken the time. Half a century of writing, 14 books in print, and nobody had ever written a biography of him. So I wanted to find out who was Kurt Vonnegut, the author of these, these books that suddenly uh, became so popular so suddenly because, you know, he, he was out of print, as I say, in the prologue there in the mid-60s, and by 1970 had a body of work that had been resuscitated uh, from sort of the ash heap of literature, um, like um, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, and um, Sirens of Titan, Mother Night, Cat's Cradle. He had a corpus of work suddenly, whereas before he had been just somebody who wrote um, paperback books that ended up in drugstores and bus stations next to Mr. Lucky and Conan the Barbarian. Uh, now suddenly he's the next great literary thing. So who was Kurt Vonnegut behind these novels? Um, was he the man that we thought he was? Because if you can remember Vonnegut back in the 70s, he comes across as kind of an avuncular, um, uh, joshing character with tousled hair and a chevron of a mustache upside down like Peter Max or uh, George Harrison. Uh, was he, in fact, that man? Did he embody some of the virtues that were in his novels about humanity and being kind to each other? And then finally, I wanted to try and figure out where, if any place, does his, does his, do his novels belong in the canon of American literature? Because, you know, the, the jury's still kind of out on that. Although Kurt Vonnegut is an iconic cultural figure, there are still some people today who really don't, ha are not agreed upon his worth as a post-American, uh, post-World War II American author. In fact, one of the last days I was with him, we were walking down the street together, and I said, you know, I have to be honest, Kurt, that uh, my editor, uh, when I told him about doing a book with you, said, well, Kurt Vonnegut, isn't he kind of a cult author? And this was 2006. And he shrugged and he said, boy, I still get a lot of that. So he never felt that he quite broke out of the science fiction ghetto that he had been consigned to in the 1950s and 1960s, that the eggheads and the critics in New York never gave him his due. So there was some things about his literary legacy that I wanted to explore. And as I say, I wanted to find out whether he belonged in the pantheon of American writers. Well, let me tell you how I approached him. Um, it was 2006. and um, I had finished the Mockingbird book, and what I did was I wrote Vonnegut a letter. And I just told him I wanted to do a biography of him. It was as simple as that. I said that I was surprised that none had ever been done yet, um, and um, I thought I could deliver a good one for him. Well, instead of a reply to my letter, what I received was, well, it was a form of reply, but it wasn't a letter per se. It was a 20 by 17 piece of paper like artists use, torn out of a sketch pad. And on it was a big sketch that Kurt had done of himself, smoking and sort of looking up bemused. And underneath it said, this is a portrait of me demurring on the offer of Charles J. Shields to be my biographer. And I thought, what kind of response is that? So I propped it up on the, on the mantelpiece. My wife looked at it for a few days. My wife and I looked at it. And she was the one who pointed out that demurring is not a very strong word. It's not like absolutely not or, or don't do it or, uh, you know, or I'll have the law on you, something like that. It's demurring. The way somebody might say uh, at Thanksgiving when you offer them a second piece of pie and they go, no, I, I couldn't possibly, but, but maybe. So I wrote back to him again, and this is a sort of a technique I picked up from reading an interview with Truman Capote one time. He said, if you're going to get to know somebody, and if you're going to interview them especially, you have to reciprocate. You can't just ask them questions and ask to take away things from them. So, what was your childhood like? How did your parents get along? Uh, what's the first memory you can recall? Things like that. You have to ante up. You've got to throw down, in a sense. You've got to show the other person about you as well. So this second letter was really a small biography of me. I told Kurt that I wanted a chance to do it all over again. And I said, look, you grew up in Indianapolis. I grew up in Chicago. You were a public relations uh, person for General Electric. My father worked in public relations for Ford Motor Company. Um, your son, Mark, is about my age. You were, a former, you were a journalist for a while. I was a journalist for a while. So I found all these commonalities between us. 
And then kind of immodestly, I guess, I ended up at the end of